I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to look at two verses of Scripture. Philippians chapter 4, and those verses are 8 and 9. Philippians 4, verse 8 and 9. I'm reading from the ESV. Finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's just, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. I've titled this study, Your Mind Really Matters. One fellow said, of all the things I've lost, it's my mind I miss the most. <laughs> Looking out on the landscape of our present world, I keep coming to the same conclusion. And unfortunately, I think it's worse than I think it is. Most of the world has lost its mind. Amen? Amen. I mean, just crazy. When I think it can't get any crazier, it just gets crazier. <clears throat> well, it should be obvious to every believer that there's a global, in fact, cosmic spiritual war going on, and the strategic battlefield of this war is the human mind. One of the primary reasons for the battle for the mind is because a person is not what they think they are. Well, let, me, let me back up. <clears throat> a person is not what they think they are, what they think they are. Do you catch the play on word? Yeah. What they think they are. What gets your attention gets you. What you look at longingly, you become like lastingly. What you behold, you become. What you see, you will be. Because this is the focus of your attention. Wrong thinking leads to wrong assumptions, wrong conclusions, and wrong beliefs, which leads to wrong behavior. Let me give you an illustration of wrong conclusions produced by reasoning based upon wrong assumptions. The Japanese eat very little fat and suffer fewer heart attacks than Americans. The Mexicans eat a lot of fat and suffer fewer heart attacks than Americans. The Chinese drink very little red wine and suffer fewer heart attacks than Americans. The Italians drink excessive amounts of red wine and suffer fewer heart attacks than Americans. The Germans drink a lot of beer, eat lots of sausage, and suffer fewer heart attacks than Americans. Conclusion, eat and drink what you like. Obviously, speaking English is what kills you. <laughs> we, we, we must become ready and regular repenters that repent of wrong thinking. What is wrong thinking? Well, for the Christian, wrong thinking is thinking not based upon the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. In other words, my thinking should be kingdom-born, kingdom-based, kingdom-bordered, and kingdom-building or kingdom-extending. And to the extent that it's not, I need to keep my repenter limbered up and repent. So there's just two big ideas in this study, but they're big, big ideas. Number one, we must focus our attention carefully. And then number two, we must feed our minds correctly. We must focus our attention carefully. Now notice in verse 8 of chapter 4, the phrase, think on, or one translation says, dwell on these things. Now this word, logazomai, is imperative form. That's the, that's the mood of command. So it's a command. Thus, that means that proper thinking is not optional <clears throat> in the Christian life. Logizomai means more than just entertaining thoughts. It means to evaluate, to consider, to calculate. And there's a world of difference between just thinking something and thinking and dwelling and meditating and considering and evaluating and calculating in order to approve or disprove. So believers are to consider the qualities Paul lists in this verse and meditate on their implications. The verb form calls for habitual discipline of the mind 
to set all thoughts on these spiritual virtues. The Bible leaves no doubt that people's lives are the product of their thoughts. Proverbs 23, 7 is a great verse. For as he thinks or as a man thinks within himself, so he is. For as he thinks within himself, so he is. The modern counterpart to that proverb is the computer term that I used last week, gigo. What does gigo mean? Garbage in, garbage out. In other words, the computer's output is dependent upon his input. And so people's actions are a result of their thinking. Being a Christian isn't becoming positive in our thinking, but becoming a, po a possessor of the positive thinker himself, which is Jesus. You have the mind of Christ as a Christian, thus you have the positive thinker within you. And living in our renewed spirits so that the whole orientation of our minds is reset from self and sin to the Savior and salvation. Think on or dwell is not only imperative mood, it's present tense, which means we should go on habitually doing this. It's an active voice, not passive, indicating we may make a choice. We, we can't help what comes to mind, but we can help dwelling on that. It's like someone said, you can't help the birds from flying over and landing in your hair, but you don't allow, have to allow them to make a nest there. You need to learn how to uh, take captive every thought and bring it, bring it captive to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Well, John Piper observes, uh, however, he says, the root issue is more than right thinking. It's right, right valuing. Not just proving, but right approving. Not just right testing, but right treasuring. And then he gives an illustration that, that uh, might help a little bit, uh, bring a little bit of clarity on the phrase, think on these things. He said, it would be possible perhaps to teach an uneducated person to recognize some of the traits of gold without his knowing how valuable gold is. So you might give him a job panning gold with you in a stream and pay him a dollar an hour while he accurately tests the yellow stones and tosses thousands of dollars worth of gold nuggets into your bag, not knowing the real value of gold. This is not the kind of renewal Paul is talking about. He's not saying read enough books or listen to enough tapes or sermons so that you can spot a good deed when you see it and then work up the discipline to do it. What he's saying is be so renewed in the spirit of your mind, so deeply renewed in your mind that you can not only test and spot gold when you see it, but love gold, approve gold, treasure gold. That's what this word means. Not just so that you approve it and start thinking right, but that thinking leads you to the ultimate thinker and to the positive thinker himself, our Lord Jesus Christ. So that your, 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 your thoughts begin to line up with God's thoughts and you learn to think God's thoughts after him. That's the goal of the Christian life. So now you can see that the renewal involved is more than a logic lesson. It's more than uh, just logical reason, uh, major premise, minor premise, conclusion. Uh, logic is good, but this transcends logic. Mind renewal is a deep spiritual change in how the mind assesses uh, and values things. So let's look at eight virtues that are listed and kind of given to serve as guideposts to keep you in your right mind. If you're not in your right mind, this will help you get in your right mind. Um, <clears throat> first of all, focus on the real as opposed to the phony. That's whatever is true. Focus on the real as opposed to the phony, the fake. What is true? Well, truth is whatever for the Christian and for anyone, whatever conforms to the gospel and the revelation of God's will in God's word. Truth defined by the dictionary is whatever conforms to objective reality. Let me say it again. Truth is whatever conforms to objective reality. Question, how do you change the way people think? You start by changing the meaning of the words they use. 
Now, just just uh, as one teacher used to say, put on your thinking cap, Wade. Put on your thinking cap. Just just reflect back over uh, the past weeks and months and few years. In fact, here in in our country, and see if it doesn't remind you of Orwell's dystopian novel, 1984. In that novel, uh, he, he, the language has changed from old speak to new speak. And new speak is the language devised by the totalitarian gov government of Oceania to replace English. So new speak, new speak occurs whenever the main purpose of language, which is to describe reality, is replaced by a rival purpose of asserting power over it. If you haven't figured it out, everything that's going on now is about power. Ultimately, it's about power. So, in the, in the novel, 1984, Orwell refers to the totalitarian government as Big Brother. He shows how the government does away with all undesirable and unnecessary words and meanings, even going so far as to routinely rewrite history and punish thought crimes. In fact, they had a hole called memory hole and, and scores of people were enlisted in writing history every day. But when they finished writing, they threw it down memory hole and started over the next day. Be because if you can't remember the past, you're going to, you're going to repeat it again and again. And the terminology uh, he called the thought police. There, there was a there was a government agency called the thought police, and they kind of serve as the eyes and ears of Big Brother. And then they had a ministry of peace, which was really nothing but a ministry of war. Uh, they had a ministry of plenty, which dealt with economic things, but it was nothing about it. All it dealt with was rationing and starvation. They had a ministry of love. And that was about nothing but torture and brainwashing. Then they had a ministry of truth. And this dealt with news, entertainment, education, art. And what was it? Propaganda. It was all phony. And here was the, here was the mottos of Oceania. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. And ignorance is strength. And what's your problem? Never in my lifetime. <clears throat> Or as best I can discern in the history of our country, have we seen so much phony as opposed to the real in language and in lifestyles? It's like we moved into a fantasy world. Truth is whatever you want it to be. It's your truth. It's my truth. It's their truth. Gender's whatever you choose. Today you can be this. Tomorrow you can be that. It's not between your legs. It's between your ears. Whatever you think you want to be, you can be. Men can get pregnant. Anyone who says something that hurts your feelings or challenges the morality of your choices and actions is guilty of hate speech. If you question the integrity of the 2020 election, you're a domestic terrorist. Anyone who degree, uh, disagrees with the current politically correct narrative is an intolerant, racist, homophobic, fascist, white supremacist, even if you're as black as a midnight. You're a white supremacist, homophobic, racist. That's, that is focusing on the phony, a fantasy world, and not the world of reality. But here's what I promise you what happens. Eventually, all fantasy meets reality. All fantasy meets reality. So I can spend the rest of my time there, but that's enough. I'd really get mad then. Uh, hey, Focus on the real as opposed to the phony. Number two, focus on the serious as opposed to the frivolous, whatever's honest. The word honest or honorable means that, uh, means that which is noble or dignified, lofty, elevated, venerable, august. What Paul is saying is, hey, get your mind off of low and base things. Get your mind out of the gutter. Get your attention off of frivolous things. Whatever is sublime, whatever is majestic, whatever evokes reverence and respect, rather than the vulgar, the crude, the frivolous, and the trivial, get your mind on those things that are serious. That doesn't mean that we um, go around with a long face and depressed about everything that's going on and never laugh and 
think if you laugh, you sinned against God. That's ridiculous. Uh, I've been over the years, I've, over the years, I've been accused of, of having too much humor, expressing too much humor in my preaching and teaching. And I said, if you knew how much I was holding back, you wouldn't say that. Uh, Spurgeon said, somebody asked him, do you think Jesus ever laughed? And he said, I don't know if he did or not, but he sure fixed me where I can. <laughs> and, and one of the things we've lost in this crazy world is the ability to laugh at ourselves. Just poke fun and laugh. It's funny. I mean, we're funny creatures, right? right. <laughs> I laugh at myself all the time. <laughs> That's crazy. Focus on the serious as opposed to the frivolous. And then thirdly, focus on the right as opposed to the convenient. Whatever is just. In other words, whatever is in accord with divine standards of right and, right and wrong. Again, we live in a day when any such notion that there's an ultimate righteousness, an eternal unchanging justice is simply ignored or perhaps even mocked, usually mocked. And then number four, focus on the clean as opposed to the dirty, whatever is pure. That word pure is hognos, comes from the root word for holy or holiness and sanctification. And it refers to what is unmixed with moral impurities and is set apart to be ethically clean. So it's what is unmixed with filth or adulterated with moral corruptions. So he's calling us to fix our thoughts on those things that are untainted by evil or moral corruption that are lacking in defect or morally blameless. And then focus on the lovely as opposed to the discordant, whatever is lovely. This speaks of that which is pleasing, attractive, and beautiful, and which it reflects ethical beauty. Lovely is the opposite of what is raw, crude, and ugly. Whatever is lovely is that which is beautiful in the eyes of God and spiritually attractive to those who are pure in heart. And again, I could easily, think things are so discordant and the language you use, we use today as acceptable language is mind boggling to me. My second grade teacher would wash your mouth out if you ever said a dirty word. She'd wash your mouth out with soap. I can see there were twins and they got a late start and they were about three years older than the rest of us second, first and second graders. And their names were Rayford and Grayford. <laughs> How creative can you get? <laughs> and they came from a difficult family situation and they cursed like sailors. And I can see I can see Grayford now sitting during recess while the rest of us are playing and he's cursing with, with lava soap bubble, bubbles coming out of his mouth. <laughs> She'd take lava soap and wash his mouth out to get it never did any good. It takes more than soap <laughs> to get down to the heart. But, but what I'm saying, I like the F-bomb. I never dreamed of a day. I mean, I, in my day, no doubt I would have used it before I got saved. But it just, it's just a conversational piece today in, 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 in almost every sentence. Just thrown out like, it's, you know, like we'd say golly or something like that. It's mind-boggling. That's the reason we lost our mind. <laughs> All right, lovely as opposed to discordant. Focus on the valuable as opposed to the vulgar, whatever's commendable. The word uh, euphemous is, means of good repute. And the idea refers to what, whatever's well spoken of by God and highly respectable in his eyes. Listen to Ephesians 5, 4. There must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. And then focus on the excellent, as opposed to the inferior, if there is any excellence. Too many Christians settle for mediocrity. They're okay with just getting by. Good enough is the mantra. But let me tell you, I believe God calls us to excel in all that we do uh, that's within our power, and by his grace, we are to pr pursue and produce the very best. And Sam Storms describes excellence as doing everything to the best of one's ability as enabled by God and in such a way that no one is distracted by it or is tempted to give credit to anyone but the Lord. And then last of all, focus on the positive as opposed to the negative. If there is anything worthy of praise, 
Now this encompasses whatever is or can be praised by God. It means we should think about whatever can be applauded in the presence of God. Christians focus their thoughts upon only whatever can be commended by God. Now, to put it another way, this is whatever can be extolled by the holiness of Almighty God. Let the minds of believers be set upon these things. Now the command in verse 8 to think about all the wonderful and lovely things listed here <clears throat> runs directly opposite to the habits of mind instilled by the modern media. Read the newspapers, which few people do anymore, or watch TV or get your news off the internet like I do. Their stock and trade is anything that's untrue, unholy, unjust, impure, ugly, of ill repute, vicious and violent and blameworthy. That's news. Now, I'm going to quote this from Sam Storms. It's convicting. I want to repent. The American addiction to TV is one example of the enemy of what Paul says in this passage. The average American spends a minimum of four hours a day watching TV. The American child spends 900 hours a year in school and from 1,200 to 1,800 hours a year watching TV. By the age of 20, the average American has seen 800,000 TV commercials. That was before recording it and running it forward, so you don't have to watch a commercial. Anyway, back to the point. Before a child finishes elementary school, they, have, they will have seen 8,000 murders. By the time they are 18, they will have seen 200,000 acts of violence. And here's a really, really scary thought. <clears throat> By the time the average American reaches the age of 65, he or she will have spent nearly eight years watching TV. Eight years. A little bit here, a little bit there. Am I against TV? No. Especially if it's a good ball game on or a good killing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, every now and then you just got to turn on a movie that's got some killing in it if you're me. You know, I, I like war movies stuff like that. I'm sorry. I, I repent, but I have to keep my repenter limbered up because I backside pretty easy along those lines. <laughs> I'm sorry. You, you had higher thoughts of me than that, right? <laughs> well, here's the reality. We must feed our minds correctly. We must not only focus on what is true, we must feed our minds correctly. Now, look again at verse 9. Philippians 4. What you have learned and received, heard and seen. Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Do you have all those other scriptures in your notes? Romans 12, 2. Re read that with me. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Then Ephesians 4, 23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And then Colossians 3, 2. Set your minds on things that are above and not on things that are on the earth. Now, obviously, these are commands and obviously we have a choice to make. For example, in Colossians 3, 2. Set your minds on things above. That's a choice to make. So I have to be continually choosing against myself and choosing against even the thoughts that are there because, again, the world system, myself, and the enemy is an imparter of and an attempt to implant thoughts in my mind. But I have to learn how to do spiritual warfare in the battle for my mind so that I learn how to stand against those lies and begin to declare the truth of God over those situations. So how do we go about feeding our minds correctly? Well, it's more than just reading good books and, and, and reading the Bible. That's essential but you can read and still not be feeding your mind the truth. Remember, again, it's more than just reading. It's thinking on and valuing and, and uh, approving and appropriating that truth. Well, I suggest three things here. Learning by feeding our minds on God's truth. The first two words, learned and received, refer to Paul's teaching. The last two, heard and seen, point to his example or conduct. So you and I need the input and example and influence of godly people in our lives. You need to be one who is an example and influence to others as well. 
Now, this is a key verse in disciple making, verse 9, because disciple making is better caught than it is taught. It's not a matter of importation of information. It's a matter of importation of a life. First, my love, my life, and then my learning. We think it's only about learning, but that's not the case at all. So from whom are you learning? Who is, you, who is mentoring you? Are you being discipled? Are you discipling others? Clearly, Paul believed passionately in the importance of godly, Christ-like role models who embody and live out the virtues he just enumerated in verse 8. Where are those people in, in your life? Where, 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 where are you in that, in that respect in other people's lives? So we learn by feeding our minds on God's truth. And number two, by listening. Listening by fine-tuning our ears to build our faith. Jesus spoke more about hearing than any other subject. He counseled men to take, be careful what you hear, how you hear, and that you hear. Let me say it again. That you hear, what you hear, and how you hear. Why would he talk so much about hearing? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's impossible to please God without faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing not just by reading the word of God or listening to it. Hearing comes by not just the logos of God, but by the charema of God, the spe specific words from the word. That's what it means when, you, when it says faith comes by hearing. It's not just hearing any word, the general word, is getting specific word for you for that moment from the word of God. So listening by fine-tuning our ears. And boy, you have to fine-tune them. We have a whole system in our, in our brain that enables us to filter, filter out uh, what eventually would just dominate our brain. That's the real challenge. And you get to the place where you can just turn that off and not pay any attention to anybody, especially your wife. Someone suggested that I get a hearing aid. And I said, I hear more now than I want to hear. So, <laughs> Look by focusing, number three, looking by focusing our eyes on those who model the faith. They observed Paul's life, watched how he interacted with others. They listened to his casual conversation. They set their eyes on his demeanor, how he faced and endured trials, how he bore up under unjust treatment and persecution. And they said, I, I want to be like that. In fact, that's what Paul said on more than one occasion, especially places like 1 Corinthians, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow me, mimic me, imitate me as I follow Christ, as I imitate Christ. So, with your Bibles still open, if they are, let, let your eyes drift back up to uh, verses 4 through 7 of chapter 4. Just scan down through there. Rejoice. The Lord is at hand. Uh, don't worry. Pray about everything. Give thanks for anything. And notice what he's the conclusion of that. And the peace of God will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So once more, Paul concludes with the promise that if we ponder and think and meditate on these things and give them weight in the daily decisions of life and then put all this into practice, the God of peace will be with us and the peace of God will be in us. So the God of peace will be with us and the peace of God will be in us because the person of all peace lives within us to begin with. And we have the mind of Christ. Well, what more could we possibly hope for? By the way, the promise of God being with us is the promise of more than merely his presence. It includes the experience of his favor, his blessings, his guidance, his protection, his constant power to help us do whatever needs to be done. D did you hear what I said? It's not just, well, I, I know God's with me. He, he promised to be with me. No, he's with me in a special way. He's with me. The peace of God operating in me means that I know and enjoy his favor the world may be falling apart. It may be very difficult circumstances, but that's not what he's talking about. You're not living under circumstances. You're living under the grace of God. And by that, then you make a choice against the domination of circumstances and your own wrong thinking and give your mind over to the mind of Christ within you so you can rise above the circumstances and make a choice to rejoice and fix your attitude with gratitude. 
Now, that's what he said in chapter 4. Make a choice to rejoice. It is a choice. It's not circumstantial. It's a choice right in the midst of the hell you're going through to stand and having done all, stand and make a choice to rejoice and fix your attitude with gratitude because anything short of hell is mercy. So I'm, I, I'm not going to hell. I'm headed for heaven. So anything that happens to me is still mercy and not what I deserve. Amen? Amen. All right, so... Uh, your mind really matters. I mean, it really, really does. I've given a, a, a prayer there uh, that I recommend you use on a regular basis. I'm, I'm not going to read it. It's, it's about, it'll take you about two minutes to, to pray that prayer. But, but it's about dealing with what I call UFOs. Do you know that's one of the major battles in your mind, UFOs? What is that? Well, it's not some something flying through the sky, something lodged that's already flown into your mind and lodged there. It's unidentified falsehoods that have been obstructing, that have been obstructing the supernatural flow of the Spirit in your life. And let me say it again. Unidentified falsehoods that have been obstructing the supernatural flow of the Spirit in your life. What would be some of those? Stronghold arguments, theories, reasoning. You're a nobody. You'll never amount to anything. You're so ugly you'd have to slip up on the dipper to get a drink. You, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a hillbilly expression. You probably don't even know what a dipper is. We used to have, I used to hate to go to these things when I was a kid, these family reunions, and they have a bucket to drink out, and they just have one dipper, and my grandmother dipped snuff. Oh, my goodness. You had to drink out of the dipper. Forgive me. <laughs> anyway, let's, let's conclude by, by the, uh, uh, the message. Uh, and the paraphrase of Philippians 4.8. Re read that with me. Summing it all up, friends, I say you'll do best by filling your minds and meditating on things true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious. The best, not the worst. The beautiful, not the ugly. Things to praise, not things to curse. So I suggest you take these eight points also, and make it a prayer. Praying something like this. Father, enable me to daily, yea, even minute by minute, bring my thoughts captive and focus on the real as opposed to the phony, the serious as opposed to the frivolous, the right as opposed to the convenient, the clean as opposed to the dirty, the lovely as opposed to the discordant, the valuable as opposed to the vulgar, the excellent as opposed to the inferior, the positive as opposed to the negative. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.